Well, good morning, One Missoula Church. How are we? Good week? All right, so question is, on the table, how would you run things if you were God? Right? All-powerful, all-knowing, supposedly all-loving, what would you change? Would there still be pain, sorrow, suffering, death, mosquitoes, traffic circles, United States Congress, right? We don't, we don't, what would you do, right? If you had the power, how would the world look differently? You ever thought about that? Have you ever thought and looked and said, man, if I were in charge, if I had all the power and all the knowledge and all the, the, the ability that God claims to have in his word, I would make things look a whole lot different. So think about it. What would you do? You know, this becomes a huge hang up for a lot of people. A lot of people look at the world and there's like, the, the main issue has to do with, with pain, sorrow, suffering, and death, right? If, if God is all loving and he's all powerful, why can I turn on the news? Why can I get online? Why can I start looking at things and I see all of this pain, all of this sorrow, suffering, death, and God claims to be all loving or all powerful? And it becomes a big obstacle for people. And people will reject God, they'll reject the Bible based on the idea of pain, sorrow, suffering, and death paired with the claims that God is all loving and all powerful. It becomes a real challenge for people. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna continue in our story. We started the Gospel of Matthew a handful of weeks ago. And we've basically moved through the, the, the Christmas story uh, a little bit. We're going to finish up the Christmas story this week, but we're not going to uh, just completely conclude it because I'm going to hit actually this section again next week. But this week, I want to pull something out because I want to look at pain. I, I really want to push this issue. I really want to step in and just kind of sit down and pause on this huge obstacle for faith or a huge generator for doubt for those who will step into faith, right? You, you commit to relationship with Christ, but then all this doubt comes in when pain, sorrow, suffering, and death enters into your world. And this is the universal experience, y'all. We all go through this stuff. We all go through things where we're like, how could God be all loving and all powerful? So up to this point in this story, what you've got is God bringing Jesus miraculously into creation, right? A, a, uh, an angel appears to uh, this young couple, uh, this young Jewish couple, Mary and Joseph, and they're betrothed. That's like a step above our version of engagement. And Mary is told, hey, you're going to have a child, even though you've never been with a man. She even asks that, like, hey, how, would I, how is this going to happen, even though I've never been with a man? And then she goes and she tells her fiancé's husband-to-be, and his name's Joseph. And Joseph goes, man, well, I, I just don't buy that. I don't believe you. And then God appears to him in a dream and says, hey, it's actually okay. Go ahead and marry Mary. And so... Uh, and go and take her as your wife. The child that is in her is from the Holy Spirit. And so he gets this confirmation. It's this supernatural thing that God shows up in a dream. And the reason I'm pressing into that right now is because you're gonna see more dream stuff in the passage that we look at today. And you're also gonna see a bunch of people get slaughtered when God could have given them a dream that says, hey, flee. And he doesn't. And that's where we're gonna go. And so after... Jesus shows up on the scene, right? These guys called uh, Magi come to Jerusalem because they think that's where the king is going to be born. And they go to the palace and they speak to a guy named Herod. And he turns out to be this huge tyrant, uh, except you can think of him like Hitler, but without all the power. And so they say, hey, where's the king of the Jews? And so they, uh, Herod finds that out for them. And then they go and uh, seek out Jesus and they bring him gifts. And it's fantastic. That's your manger scene sort of, and uh, they come and they show up and we're gonna have them leave and I want you to catch up here with what's going on. And the main thing that I'm after today is that God could have stopped the slaughter of all these babies and he doesn't. Because there's about to be a bunch of babies slaughtered by a complete maniacal tyrant and God supposedly from what God says about himself in the Bible could stop it and he doesn't. And he doesn't. All right, let's go. Okay, Matthew 2, verses 13 through 23. It'll be up on the screens. You can pull it up on your devices or you got handouts, right? Everybody got a handout when you came in? You got that. So you can follow along. If you can see, I know it's dim. This is as bright as we can get it unless it's like blinding. And then we'll get all those comment cards. We get comment cards from you guys. Like one of you submitted a prayer request a few weeks ago. I pray to be able to see my Bible during church. I'm like, keep praying. Me too, man. I'm there. All right, Matthew 2, 13 through 23. So here we go. 
Now, when they had departed, the they is the wise men. When the wise men had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. There you go, there's the dream again, right? Miraculous thing. Angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and he says, rise, Joseph. This is, uh, this is Jesus' basically stepfather, right? Who's adopted him. Rise, take the child and his mother, that's Mary, and flee to Egypt. So they're in Jerusalem and they're gonna go down to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. There you go, warning, right? The angel of God appears to Joseph and says, hey, get out of there because Herod is gonna try to destroy Jesus. Why doesn't he tell all the kids that? I I wanna press the issue today. Right, And if you haven't asked that question, now you will, every Christmas from here on out. Why didn't he warn all of the parents of the children? Right? All right, so Herod, verse 14. Herod's gonna destroy Jesus. And so he rose, this is, uh, this is uh, Joseph, right? He rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. So they leave from, uh, from Israel and go down into Egypt. And they remain there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken uh, by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked, so Herod, this is the tyrant guy who's gonna kill some people. He's a a threatened false king and Jesus shows up as the true king and Herod's like, I'm gonna put a stop to this. So Herod, in verse 16, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, the magi, Uh, became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. So he's having the conversation with the wise men. Hey, when did you guys see the star? Apparently they said two years ago and Herod finds out he gets tricked that Jesus has escaped. And so Herod's like, I am not going to suffer any rival to my crown, to my throne. I'm Herod, I wanna be known as great. He's actually on his deathbed at this point and he wants to be remembered as being this great king. And this rival shows up and he's like, slaughter all the babies in Bethlehem, two years old and younger. And he succeeds. He does it. Now, Bethlehem, small town. You need to think like 20 kids, which is a lot. Like one kid would be horrible. 20, atrocious. But Bethlehem, boys, two years old and younger, we're talking 20, 25, 30 kids. Because this tyrant just shows up, says, I will not be threatened. And so you've got God miraculously bringing Jesus into existence. And you've got God giving dream warnings to Joseph and to the Magi, you're gonna see here in a second. And he doesn't warn the parents and he doesn't kill Herod. And he doesn't stop the soldier. I mean, you could, like, you could just come up with whatever scenario you want that this doesn't take place, and yet God allows it. And that's what I wanna deal with today because that's real life. That's real life for every single one of us in this room. So, okay, okay, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's keep going, okay? So he goes and has everybody killed two years old and under. So I'm in verse 17. So verse 17, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. We're gonna hit these prophecies next week. All right, so I'm gonna hit the Old Testament stuff here next week, which I'll tell you about in just a second, but we're just gonna kind of brush through those because I wanna deal with the pain, sorrow, suffering issue today. All right, verse 19. But when Herod died, so there he is. He was on his deathbed. He dies, quick. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt saying, rise, take the child and his mother. So so Joseph and Mary and Jesus are all in Egypt at this point. Joseph gets a dream and says, rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. So return back back to Israel for those who sought the child's life are dead. That's Herod. That's Herod and the people that Herod was sending out to kill Jesus. And he rose, that's Joseph, he rose. And he took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father, Herod, this is one of Herod's kids, his successor, he, Joseph, was afraid to go there and being warned in a dream, again, a warning, in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled that he, Jesus would be called a Nazarene. 
All right, we're going to talk about that one prophecy that gets fulfilled here today. So here's the deal. Matthew's main point in this passage, Matthew, uh, Matthew is one of Jesus' 12 disciples. He's actually writing the, the gospel of Matthew so that we can understand the story of Jesus. His main point for this passage is not dealing with pain, sorrow, suffering, and death. Okay, that's not his main point for what we're doing. What he's doing is he's setting Jesus up as Israel. So we're gonna cover that next week. It's a big thing. There's lots of Old Testament. And one thing I know about a lot of church folks is they just don't have a good handle on Old Testament. Old Testament is tough, right? Like it's what? It's like, it's like the, the second week of February and you started a read through the Bible plan back in January and it was Old Testament. And so you're like, you know, like five weeks behind, you know, like Old Testament's tough. So, so I want to take a whole week and kind of cover the Old Testament stuff because I want you guys to have a handle on the first two thirds of your Bible. I want you to be able to pick it up and read it and go, okay, this is what's going on. I want to give you kind of an outline of, a skeleton to, to fill in the blanks, right? So that's where we're going to go next week because that's Matthew's main point. That's what he is doing with this passage. What we're going to do with it is deal with this pain thing because I think the pain thing becomes a huge obstacle for most people. The pain and the suffering and the sorrow and the death and God's supposedly all loving and all powerful. And look, listen, let me, let me say something. I believe he is. I 100% believe that he is. But trying to pair those two things becomes such a huge obstacle for people. It becomes a monster challenge for people. So first thing um, I want you to fill in in your notes is this. In both the Bible and life, God frequently allows the evil that you would prevent. Right? In both the Bible, again and again and again in the Bible, and in life, from your experiences, from the people who have betrayed you, from the people who have uh, misrepresented you, from the people who hurt you, from the hurt that you've done to others, from the horrible accidents to the disease to the natural disasters, all of it, right? You would look and say, how is that possible? I would change these things. Now, I want to pause here for just a second. Um, a lot of you guys I'm still getting to know just because it's new church and new faces and things like that, so we don't know each other just yet. This isn't just academic for me. One of the earliest memories I have as a child is four years old, my mom and dad coming in to tell me that they were splitting up and dad's not going to live with us anymore. Right? That's one of the earliest. It wasn't the earliest, but I was four. They separated when I was four, divorced when I was eight. When I was 12, I'm standing in a hospital with my dad hooked up to a bunch of machines while he's lying in bed being treated for cancer at 12. And he recovered. When I'm in my 20s, I get a phone call. I'm at the University of Florida, working at Dillard's. Don't know how that happened. Working at Dillard's, get home, get a phone call. Hey, you need to come see your family in Charlotte, North Carolina. Your stepfather has been in an accident. He was playing flag football, running into the end zone. Somebody shoved him in the back. Flag football shoves him in the back, and his head goes to the ground, torques over his neck, C5, C6, partial spinal cord injury, quadriplegic. Flag football, right? Becomes a huge challenge for my mom, huge challenge to my sister's faith because of what we're talking about here today. It's a challenge, right? Um, the whole time, I'm, I'm trying to follow God. I'm trying to move towards ministry and seminary and, and you know, like kind of get prepped to be able to faithfully preach the word. I'm trying to just honor God and I can't find a girl that will keep step with me who I also want to hang out with, right? And finally, I find her. One day, I get, I, I get a job uh, at a church as a youth pastor for our sending church, actually, in team church uh, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's called team church and I get the call and I get the offer and the lead pastor goes, hey, I got you a job and I got you a girl. I'm like, all right, like this job, right? Her name was Janet Devity. She served in the student ministry, which I served in as well. So I was a youth pastor. She was one of the youth workers. Recently had come to Christ because her mom had died from cancer and the pain actually drove her to God. So we meet up, we start hanging out, start talking, faithfully following Jesus, faithfully trying to honor God with our lives. One night, about six months after we start dating, she goes out for a run, doesn't come back. I hop in a car. It takes me about, what, 10, 15 minutes to find the accident scene. She was running with earbuds in. 
and was crossing a crosswalk and a truck went by and she stepped out after the truck and there was a trailer. Head trauma, done. Just like that. I move on, God redeems that. I meet Margaret. We get married. Get excited to have kids. Right before we move out here, back in 2012, find out we're pregnant, super excited about that, miscarriage. Find out shortly again after that, miscarriage, back to back, start getting scared at that point, right? Fortunately, God has blessed us with kids since then, but heartbreaking to go through. One of the toughest things I've ever done as a pastor, this one wasn't me, step up from the miscarriage, was there was a little girl and a family connected to uh, our, our church, and the grandmother approached me to do this little girl's funeral. Little two-year-old girl, I think she was right around two, gets sick, not feeling well. Mom takes her over to the hospital. Hospital checks her out, says, eh, just go home, sleep it off. Next morning, the child's gone. Mom finds her dead in the crib. Hardest thing I've ever done as a pastor was that child's funeral. I've had a front row seat to these things. Listen, here's the deal. I am not trying to one up anything that you've gone through because you've gone through some dark, dark, horrible things also. You have been betrayed. You've been lied about. You've lost loved ones. Relationships have fallen apart. Children or siblings or parents are estranged. You've lost a lot of money because somebody stole it from you or betrayed you or what have you, right? You've gone through this too. And it's always weird to me when people are like, oh yeah, well, I will see your bankruptcy and raise you a miscarriage. Like it's, it's, it's this strange thing, this jockeying that people do. That's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is just simply say, look, this is, this is real for me. It's not just academic. There are things, right, that in both the Bible and life that God frequently allows, the evil, the pain, the sorrow, the suffering, and the death that you would prevent. All right, look at Proverbs 21, one. Old Testament book of wisdom here. Verse one, one of the things that it talks about is the king's heart. So you can thank Herod at this point because Herod's really kind of this faker puppet king. But the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. Stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. So God doesn't determine everything, but he determines some things. And what he could have done was, I don't want all those babies in Bethlehem to be killed. I'll turn Herod's heart. And he doesn't. He lets Herod succeed in his evil plan. I'll tell you a story from the New Testament. All right? So in the church, in Acts chapter 5, what's going on is Jesus has warned the church. He's like, hey, a bunch of destruction's coming on Jerusalem. You guys need to be ready to flee. And so all of the Christian believers in Jerusalem early after Jesus has gone to the throne, have sold all their property and they're helping each other out. They're like, hey, you don't have a house. Hey, you don't have food. You don't have supplies, whatever. We'll share, we'll do everything. And there's this couple named Ananias and Sapphira. And so they sell some property and they bring money to the church to say, hey, this is everything we got. We wanna share it with everybody. And what they're doing is they're lying. They could have sold it and kept the money. They could have sold it and given part and said, hey, man, we're going to keep this, but we want this to go to the church. Would have been totally fine. But they lied. They were Christian hypocrites and they lie. And so they bring this money and Peter, another one of Jesus' 12 disciples, goes, hey, why did you lie, Ananias? How did you guys come? You schemed together to come up with this plan. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 5, Peter says, hey, you're going to die for what you've done. And when Ananias hear, uh, heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. All right? And then I put in your notes, you can check out the whole story in Acts 5, 1 through 11. But check this out, right? Okay, in one hand, you've got Herod who's going to go, I'm going to kill 20 to 30 baby boys. And God's like, I'll let you do that. And then over here, you've got these two hypocrites in the church that sell off some property and lie about the money that they're giving, saying that they're giving it all when they're not, right? And so the issue is the lie there. And God's like, no, you're dead. And his wife, Sapphira, actually comes in and they ask her and she dies. And okay, so right now, your mind should be like, Pfft. right? We, you didn't kill the tyrant king, God? You killed the hypocrite Christians? That's not how I would do it. 
It's not how I would do it. Right? And so this is what you have to confront in yourself when you are going to say, I'm going to surrender and submit to follow Jesus even when he doesn't do things the way I would. I'm gonna teach you a very important answer to spiritual questions and to questions of faith and to questions of Bible study. Ready? Here's your very important answer. This is a key answer for your faith journey and Bible study questions. Ready? This is very spiritual. I don't know yet. See the cap? I want you to write in yet in capital letters. This is real important. There never comes a day in this life when you have all your questions answered, period. And I put the yet in here because the apostle Paul, he's a guy who was a Jew. He's persecuting Christians early on and, and Jesus literally comes and blinds him and knocks him off his horse. And he's like, you're mine now. You're gonna serve me. And so he goes and he starts starting a bunch of churches and one of them is in a town called Corinth. And so he writes letters to these churches, okay? And so one of those is to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, he talks about the knowledge and the understanding that we have here and now. And he says this, he says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Listen, um, uh, this is not to brag. This is just to simply make a point. Okay, I've been walking with Jesus for 20 years. I came to faith at the end of my senior year of high school, right around 18 years of age. I was living with a pastor at the time and I saw the difference that Jesus made in, in a life and I surrendered my life to Christ. Didn't know up from down about pretty much anything, right? but I just started following Jesus, started chasing Jesus. About five years later, I started pre uh, preaching and teaching the Bible right? and go, to, go off to seminary. And seminary is uh, where you go after college for them to kill your faith, okay? Right? I'm just kidding. That's, it's, it's a Bible college. Can, the academia can be a bit stifling on occasion, right? But you go off and you start learning Hebrew and Greek and interpretive history and church history and all this kind of stuff, right? And all this, this uh, theological history. And if you didn't fall asleep during those phrases that I just said there, maybe you could go to seminary too. But you go and you start doing all this Bible study. And then I go on and I start teaching and preaching every week, youth ministry. And you think adults ask hard questions? Ha <laughs> ha. Middle school, high school kids, they'll bring the thunder, right? Like, why did this happen? <laughs> let's, just, <clears throat> let's play ping pong, right? You know, like that's kind of that. And then you start, I'm just preaching every week. And then I move into become a lead pastor. I just start just, just preaching and walking with people through pain, sorrow, suffering, and death. And I'm making all of these statements for you to understand that your faith and the questions that you have about God and why is there pain or how did we descend, how did God create things or in times where we got like all this stuff right? It's like a hydra. You know what a hydra is in Greek mythology? Hercules fought the hydra as a one-headed thing and he cut off the head. Whoosh, and then three heads came back out. It's like, oh, took care of that one? Like, here's what's happened to me and my faith. Is I'll ask a question about pain or sorrow or suffering or, or end times or gender roles or whatever, whatever your thing is, right? You ask these questions and you labor over this and you wonder and it creates doubt and all this kind of stuff. And then finally, one day you read something in the Bible or you hear something in a small group Bible study or you, uh, you hear something in a sermon or whatever and all of a sudden, boom, the light goes on. It's like, yeah. And that lasts for like three minutes because what happens out of that answer, out of that faith answer is you go, wait a minute. Well, if that's true, boom, three more questions that are almost always more complex than the original one that was bothering you, right? And by the way, this isn't just theology and faith. This is physics, this is chemistry, this is history, this is psychology. It doesn't matter your discipline. The reality with theology and faith and Bible though is this, your subject matter that you're asking about when you're questioning God and you've got these, these challenges that you're bringing to God, your subject matter is infinite. Infinite. Like God is forever, ongoing, infinite. And so we get answers to questions, but that only spurns or spawns, there we go, spawns more questions. So if you get this thing in your mind where it's like, I have to have all my questions answered, you will never follow Christ. I don't know 
yet. And Paul says, you're going to find out. And so what I'm after today is not necessarily answering all the questions that we've ever had, but as we seek to understand God, as we seek to understand the Lord, that we have this mind out of Deuteronomy 29, 29. Look at this. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of his law. Right? We want to be able to say this. Like, look, there are things that God has not told us. Anybody ever wish that God gave us more answers in the Bible or could have been clearer? Like, man, you said this over here and over this, uh, over here. It seems to contradict that. And I just really wish you would have been clear on that, God. Hey, and the writer of Deuteronomy, that's Moses here, says, listen, if you're going to follow God, you just have to understand. There are things that God has said, here's how this works. And then we go, yeah, what about this? And God's like, I haven't given you that. And this right here is the difference between blind faith and faith that is leaning into things that you know. Blind faith is I'm not even looking. I'm not gonna look at the pain. I'm not gonna look at the sorrow. I'm, not gonna, I'm just gonna do this, right? I'm not gonna look at the facts. I'm not gonna deal with this. The call to faith, the call to follow Jesus is this question, what do you know? What do you know? What do I know about the nature of God? What I know, what God has told me, what he has revealed is that I am loved by God. I have sinned against God. I am a rebel. I have rebelled against God. And God said, I'm not giving you up. I love you. I'm going to send my son for you. And so Jesus comes and he steps into, uh, out of eternity into humanity. He adds div uh, humanity to his divinity. He's God, right? He's been with God the Father from all eternity and he steps out of that and he puts flesh on. He's got hair and he sweats and it's just nasty because it's the Middle East 2,000 years ago. And he lives his perfect life and he's lied about and he's betrayed and he goes to the cross for you and me. For the glory of God and for the good of others. We know that. We know that there are 12 guys that followed Jesus around during his earthly ministry. Historically, we know this. We know that one guy betrayed, but of the 11 who followed, there are 11 guys who stay faithful. And they say, we saw him never sin. We saw him do miracles. We saw him perfect. We saw him whipped, crucified, and murdered. We saw him dead, and we saw him rose again. And people came to them and they said, change your story or we'll kill you, right? If I ask you, if you're wearing a red shirt and I'm like, hey, what color shirt are you wearing? And you're like, red. And I'm like, if you say red again, I'm gonna kill you, right? And I've got the weapon, I've got the means, I've got the power. I'm like, what color shirt are you wearing? And you're like, Heather Gray. These guys, their lives are threatened and they won't recant. This guy, Paul, he's a murderer. He hates Jesus. He hates Christians. He hates the church. And then all of a sudden he goes to persecute and murder some Christians over in a town called Damascus. And somewhere along the way, Jesus blinds him, knocks him off the horse and his life's forever changed. From that point forward, he's like, I'm a servant of the Lord. We know that. That's what we do know. So he had some sort of encounter with Christ where he doesn't have all of his questions answered, but he does that. We've got Jesus' half-brother James, right? Mary has Jesus, and then she goes on, and she and, and Joseph are married, so they are married, right? And they have more kids, and one of them is James, and that's Jesus' half-brother. And his half-brother thinks that he's crazy the whole time that he's alive, right? Well, we'll get to that in the gospel. But like Mary comes to get her son because people are like, man, he's claiming to be like the son of God. Like, this is crazy. So she and his brothers go to get him. And then after Jesus dies and goes and ascends into heaven, his half-brother James is like, my brother was God. Right, that's weird, right? Because you have, might have siblings. Right? Have you ever thought, yeah, Bill is God, right? Like, 
Like we know this. Does James have all of his questions answered? No. You know that God loves you. You know that you have historical evidence. You know that you have these things. You know, maybe you don't know, but you're going to right now. You might not know, but here we go. The Bible is written across about 1,600 different years by 40 different authors on three continents in three different languages, and it's unified on a wide, wide range of moral and ethical topics that most humans can't agree on. And they say the same thing. We know these things. See, here, here's, here's what I'm after today. You cannot be entitled. I demand answers. I demand to know. I demand that God does it my way. You cannot be entitled and follow the Nazarene. Okay, go back to our Matthew passage. Right, remember the end of that uh, in your notes, right? It's verse 23. Jesus goes off and he's uh, in Nazareth. And the Bible says he'll be called a Nazarene. Now, there's nowhere in the Old Testament that says the Messiah will be a Nazarene, okay? What Matthew's doing here is he's using the language of the day, which is like if I say um, uh, redneck or hillbilly, right? Just kind of like, man, oh, that guy's just a hillbilly. Just kind of, he's from the sticks. He's just ignorant, right? That's what it would mean. It's like, oh, he's a Nazarene, right? Nazareth was seen as this kind of this dump, it's this dump that there's just that nobody comes from there. Now, the prophets do say that uh, the Messiah will not have an appearance where we're like really drawn to him. He won't do all of these things that you're like, oh, wow, it's the Messiah, it's the king, right? What it does say is that he will be humble. He will have humble beginnings. Right? He's born to this girl, this virgin in Nazareth. Like he's born in a manger. He's not born in a palace, it's humility, and he grows up in the sticks. And so you've got God coming out of eternity, putting on human flesh into our world to pursue us, and he does it with complete humility, not entitlement. And so the challenge for us, if we're going to follow Jesus, is we cannot be entitled. I demand answers. Look, you should pursue answers. I am all about every single person studying the Bible and understanding the Bible and just like, like turn off social media and TV, like focus and get real and study. Chase down your answers, do it. But you're not gonna get all your answers. And while you're waiting for answers, you have to be humble because that's what Jesus was. So check this out. So Philippians 2 talks about the mindset of Christ. So Philippians 2, five through 11, this is the apostle Paul again. This is the guy who was knocked off his horse and blinded. He's the guy who hated the church and then has this radical turn to become a Christian. He's talking to the church and he says, church, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. This is God in the flesh. And he's like, I demand, he's, he's never goes, I demand my rights. He says, Humility never counts equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But this is what we've been reading about in Matthew, right? He comes out of eternity and he comes and he puts on flesh and then he lives a perfect life and he goes to the cross. Perfectly obedient, perfectly humble. He wasn't like, I wrote these laws. I made all y'all do what I want. He submits to God. He loves his enemies. Therefore, verse nine, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name. So that at the time, uh, sorry, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Look, your, your primary obstacle to faith in Christ, to redemption, your primary obstacle to salvation, to flourishing the way that God has for you to flourish in this broken world of pain, sorrow, suffering, and death is your pride. Your primary obstacle is your pride. And the Bible says that God opposes the proud. I'm pleading with you 
challenging you, asking you to step into the things that you do know while you wrestle with the things that you don't know. There are a lot of people, when they go, it's very normal, it's very human, very common, when they go through pain, sorrow, suffering, death, when you lose a, a, a child or a spouse or you're betrayed or stabbed in the back or suffer great financial loss or go through this health crisis, um, they look and they say, it shouldn't be that way. If there was an all-loving, all-powerful God, it would not be this way. And what they're really saying, what you're really saying is God is not acting how I would act. God is not running the world how I would run the world. God is operating outside of how I would do things. And what they do, very common, is they turn their back on God. And so my last admonishment, last plea is this. Do not give up promised deliverance because of impatience and pride. What I mean by impatience? What I mean by impatience? Okay, you look and you see the slaughter of 20 babies in Bethlehem in the Bible. Or you kick on the news and you see the death of or suffering of a bunch of people for coronavirus in China. Or you see starvation in Africa. Or you see children who are born to reckless, addicted parents. You see brokenness and pain and sorrow and everything in you goes, that's wrong. That's wrong. And God goes, you're right. You're right. I am making all things new. I have sent my son to begin to deal with it. And what we tend to want is now. Now, God. Fix it now, God. It's that entitlement. It's impatience. It's pride. And the tragedy that I see is people go through gut-wrenching things, horrible things. And there's hope. And the way that it gets made right is that Jesus returns. And he restores all things, and new heavens and new earth, right? And, and the Bible teaches us that in the new heavens and new earth, you will have a resurrected body there will be no more death, no more disease, no more, no more corruption. You won't be misunderstood anymore. People won't die of cancer. People won't stab you in the back anymore. That's coming. That salvation has begun. It has started. Don't turn your back on what is promised. It's promised. It is in front of us, and it is not now. The Apostle Peter, at one point, he's talking and he's, he's kind of, you know, playing devil's advocate and he's responding, saying, hey, why is God taking so long? And Peter says, God is being patient because he doesn't desire any to perish. Here's the deal. If God eradicated all evil from the world, right now, now, then a lot of your loved ones, and maybe some of you, would perish. if he eradicates all evil from the world. Many of my loved ones would perish. And so God is patient and he's pleading, and he's pursuing. He's chasing after and he calls us to trust him and he says, I know that you don't have all the answers, but as you seek answers and you grow in knowledge, and as you move towards the promise, have patience and have humility. Have patience and have humility. Back to Proverbs, we'll end on this. Three, five through seven. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord. In order for you to trust, you have got to put down your pride. In order for you to trust, you have to have humility. 
Trust in the Lord, lean not on your own understanding, right? It's not blind faith, but look at what you do know. Look at what God has given us. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Man, if God were all loving and all powerful, he would do this. Be not wise in your own eyes. God's not like us. It's one thing he makes very clear in the Bible. He's not like us. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. This is the Almighty. This is the Creator. This is the Judge. This is the one who will bring justice and retribution for sin and evil. But he's also the Savior who pursues. The judge who will bring the condemnation is also the Savior who brings the salvation. And so you fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Look, we could spend a lot of time, we could talk about why is there pain in the world, and we, could do, we do all those things, and, and, and there's answers to those things. I would love, love time with you to be able to talk through those things and talk through your challenges and pain, and you can talk about, you can fill that in on a communication card if you want, but this is a much bigger issue. God doesn't run the world the way that we would, so what are you gonna do? God doesn't run the world like you would, because I bet, I hope, most of you, would have stopped the slaughter of all those babies in Bethlehem. And he doesn't. He doesn't send dreams. He doesn't send angels. He doesn't change Herod's mind. He doesn't. He doesn't do it the way we would do it. Can you trust what he has shown in Jesus on the cross? Can you trust him? Will you trust him? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I ask you to close your eyes. I think the pain and the sorrow and the questioning and all the challenges has been one of the greatest generators of doubt for me as a, a follower of Christ. And so I, I hope you can just hear me coming alongside you um, not whipping, not chastising, but just saying, man, I get it, I get it. Keep trusting. Keep pressing forward. Now, Josh, Josh is going to play here in a minute, and what I want you to do is just take some time. And I want you to pray. And if you're not accustomed to praying, then I'm going to give you a couple things to, to maybe say or think uh, while you're just, just pausing here for a second. I would ask God the question, God, do, do I trust you? Or if you know the answer to that, then you say, God, there are areas that I have not trusted you. Help my unbelief. That's actually something that someone says to Jesus in the Bible. There's a guy, he's in a tough spot. And he goes to Jesus and says, God, help my unbelief. And if you're prideful, if you have been prideful and you said, I demand answers, I have to know, then spend time and say, God, I've been prideful. Help my pride. If any of you have come in here today and you realize you started piecing these things together, that man, it doesn't matter what I pursue, I'm gonna have questions. It doesn't matter if it's science or history or psychology or theology or God or whatever, right? And you just realize like, I have to have answers and I've been demanding answers and it struck a chord with you today that your pride has been getting in the way. And you know that it is time to stop fighting. It is time to stop demanding answers. It is time to simply trust that God loves you. Trust that God has pursued you. And take a moment and spend some time admitting your sin. Admit your pride. Believe that Jesus has come and he's died on the cross to pay for your sins and he rose again and then commit to follow him. I want to give you guys a minute. I'm going to stop talking. I want you to ask the hard questions and when God reveals things in your lives, confess the sin. I'll give you a moment. <laughs> 